Hello everyone. Today is day three of our spiritual exercises retreat. We will do this for seven days. And let us continue. For, for those who see this for the first time, I will uh, put at the very end of the video the first two readings, day one and day two. Uh, so again, to remind you, this is mystical Catholic mystical theology written by a 16th century author. On love of self, the greatest obstacle in the spiritual life. It is now time to speak of self-love the major obstacle we shall encounter on our way to a rich spiritual life. This self-love is an egotistical, self-serving love aiming towards placing the individual above all else, including God. This founder of Babylon is the source of all wrongs and of all misfortune. It is an obstacle so great that it will incapaci incapacitate any resolve we might have to reform ourselves spiritually and aspire to God. In order to understand what this love is and how it operates, let us try to understand the following well from the very beginning. There are two enemies, two contending forces within us, each pulling in its own direction, each struggling to gain supremacy over the other and reign supreme in our souls. They are the spiritual and the mundane, love of God and love of the world. I say they are capital enemies because each struggles to achieve its own aim and objective. They are like two sovereigns, sovereigns each fighting for the establishment, uh, the establishment of their own crowns in the same kingdom. There cannot be two kings in one kingdom ruling jointly or side by side or taking turns. There can only be one. And for us, this means that there can only be one principle and primary love in our soul, one fountainhead, one source from which and through which everything else we love, we will love. This struggle is a choice, a choice between the spiritual and the ephemeral between the eternal and the transitory, between God and the world. If our first choice is not God, then naturally is going to be whatever else our will and our heart will choose it to be. And because our own self tends to favor that which it holds nearest to its heart, and being able as it is to love itself dearly, the self will choose itself. And so what we are now left with is a struggle. Let us remind ourselves a choice for primacy in our soul between two contending loves love of God and love of self. Two opposing sides for whom no agreement, no harmony, no possible compromise can ever be reached. Love of God is upright, confident, self-assured. It needs no enemies for its own self-enhancement. Self-love, on the other hand, has a chip on its old shoulder, always on the lookout to compete, to be first. It is mundane and mediocre, a bad loser, forever waging war on the spirit. 
Most unjustly, I may add, because only God can be first and primary, a truth we know instinctively through natural law and the rules of our own understanding. Love of God cannot be second or third. It is first or it is not. Even the very nature of any other love demands this exclusiveness, as I said earlier when speaking of love in general. There is nothing else worthy of being our first love but love of God. He is king of our hearts. Our hearts are his kingdom and he reigns over them. Love of God is quiet and orderly. Love of God is just, true and righteous. It is the first just choice of our soul, the first virtuous choice of our will. But what about self-love? Being against natural and divine law, what can you expect but for it to be messy and false, thwarted, inconsiderate and unjustifiable? It is against God, against truth and against nature. It is the first act of injustice, the first turmoil, injury and offense to God the first vice and the first evil, the first slap in God's face. When I take this most sovereign power to myself, I offend his majesty gravely and do him great injustice. I am in fact scorning him, taking away the honor due only to him. I am making myself God in his place. And this is the worst evil deed I can possibly do because, quite unashamedly, I am trying to take away the supremacy that belongs only to him and destroy it. I am not just disregarding God here. I am treating him as second to myself. And consequently, what I am in fact doing is snatching his crown. And this is the most grievous act of hostility we can do against God. It is the point at which unhappiness begins. And from here on, we will hop and hop from vain to fleeting pleasure all the way down to misery. Let me just say one more word about love. The nature of love is to convert the lover in the beloved. Whatever external object or creature I love, by the mere act of loving it, I transform myself in it. I become one with it. That is what love is. And so when I love myself over and above everything else, including God, I am making myself the object of my own love. In other words, I am making myself my own foundation, my own source and my own goal. My own starting point and my own end point. My own departure and my own destination outside of God and against God. I follow myself and love myself as an ending itself and everything else I happen to love, I love it only because I see myself in it, because it benefits me. I use everything and everybody as a means to satisfy and love myself. I am my own Lord and recognize no other. And in all this, what I am really doing is conferring on myself superiority over God. And having made the choice only to follow me and mine, my life will follow on accordingly. I shall end now, but let me just say one more thing. Self-love is the source of our hostility towards anything that is and has to do with God. This is because we see ourselves as, as, as gods, and each one is a god to himself. And the tragedy of all this is that we end up believing it and wanting to be treated like one, 
craving God's honour and glory for ourselves. Pride and conceit are something that hurts God deeply and that he punishes most severely. The major struggle we will face in our spiritual life and concerning which we will have to remain most vigilant is in not allowing this self-centered love to enter our souls. It is the seed of all evil, the major impediment to God. Ultimately, this is another short chapter on how the love of God, when primary in our hearts, is the source of all good and self-love is the root of all evil. Ultimately, without love, there is nothing worth having. When love is alive in us, everything else touched by this prince is inherited to its grace. All we are and all we do is affected by it. All our likes and dislikes are related to and are affected by the primary love in our hearts. And when this main love is the love of God, everything we do and everything we love springs from it and is touched by this divine treasure. It is the source of our well-being. It is our first justice and light, our rectitude and foundation of all righteousness. It is our first friend, true and good an origin of all good and trustworthy friendship. It is the primary source of our strength, our first life. Love of God is the only love that makes us divine because of the marvelous virtue love has of converting and transforming our hearts into that which we love. And since it is God we love best, we shall be deified and made one spirit with him, wanting only what he wants, for however long as he wants it. But what happens when self-love is the predominant love in our hearts? We have already seen it is the main enemy of spiritual love. I am now going to show you that Self-love is the fountain from which all ignorance, blindness, sin, vice and evil originate, and hence the source of all injustice and the root of all the pains we suffer. When Christ, our teacher, was speaking to his disciples as to the best path for them to follow for the improvement and the edification of their souls. He gave them renunciation of the self as the first precept on the way to perfection. If you would come after me, he told them, deny your soul, deny yourself. Let me say that again. If you would come after me, Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. This is from Matthew 16. This is the rule of life and contains three remarkable, intimately harmonized and indivisible affirmations. Please listen carefully. Indivisible, I say, for Christian teaching. They are like three strands of a silken rope leading us infallibly to a life of perfect perfection. If one of them breaks, the remaining two will not be strong enough to enable us to continue on our climb to heaven. It is the three of them together that constitute a trinity of precepts, each one being one in itself different from the others, but all three constituting one essence, the essence of an essentially good and virtuous life. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. If we ignore one, we will be ignoring them all, because we will be denying this essence and in so doing, stripping our life of spiritual meaning. What I mean is this. 
if we deny if we deny ourselves and pick up our cross but do not follow Christ we are not Christians we might be something else but we are not Christians pagans can deny themselves and carry a cross too alternatively even if we were to carry a cross and who is without one but not to deny ourselves we would not be following Christ why not because Christ and one's own flesh that is to say the cross and a life of worldly pleasures can never be friends it is impossible to follow Christ if we do not first exile from ourselves the pleasures and passions of both mind and body through mortification and penance. This is plainly the first step to a spiritual and religious life, to the perfect life. Deny yourself, he said. Straightforward enough sentence, but if further elaboration were needed, I would simply add this. If you want to follow Christ and walk in his footsteps and be his friend and keep him company, give up treading on your own footsteps or those that the world so seductively puts before you and cease befriending yourself over and above God. It is only by ceasing to be what you are that you will become what you are not. Cease being carnal and you will be spiritual. For being a friend of the world and also of God who is spirit is not possible. <clears throat> to live according to the appetites of mind and flesh, the pleasures and delights of the world and at the same try time trying to please God, cannot go together according to the New Testament. Chrysostom says that denying oneself means seeing oneself as one's own enemy and treating oneself as such. And he gives this example by illustration. <coughs> Excuse me, let me just... <coughs> He gives this example by illustration. Suppose you had a friend whom you esteemed and loved greatly, and so pleased were you with his company that not a moment went by that you would be apart from him or he from you. When eating, he would be at your table, when sleeping at your bedside, always with you, accompanying you everywhere, one could almost say that you were another him and he another you. And suppose that one day you were told, with good reason, to be weary of him, for he was ready not only to betray you and hand, and hand you over to your enemies, but also to take your life. You cannot believe this, of course. That's not possible, you say. You are lying to me. But... Upon investigation, you find that the account might, after all, be accurate. Astonished and bewildered, you wonder how can this be? There must be a mistake. But more evidence is brought before you and you have to admit that it is indeed true. And you cry, is it possible that he was betraying me all along? All along? Could I have been so blind as to believe that the one I thought to be my best friend was in fact my worst enemy? And your like turns to dislike and your friends friendship to animosity, your love even to hate. And you repudiate and deny him and no longer want anything to do with him. You might not even acknowledge him or be inclined to help him were you to see him beaten or persecuted. All you would want to say to him is, how could you have deceived me so? And all the while pretending to be my friend. Do not come near me. I wish for your company no more. Well, 
my dear brother, you who continue to read these words, these words, I say to you only this. Don't you realize that this body of yours you so delight in pampering and indulging, this friend for whom you seek the most succulent dishes, the dearest wines, the finest silks, the most precious jewels of the Orient, and all those artificial joys and vain pleasures, are you not yet aware that the things of this world you so persist putting all your trust upon, with whom you delight in such close company, this master at whose beck and call you serve all day and all night, this lover with whom you so pleasantly cohabit, do you not, do you not yet realize that this so-called friend is leading you down the garden path or up the garden path? that under the guise of friendship what he is doing is simply taking you along the rosiest road only to hand you over to your enemy the devil forever how wisely and with what experience spoke Solomon when he said, Do not go after your pleasures and affections. Do not follow your will. Do not tread on your own footsteps. For you will come to die at the joyful hands of your own enemies. A holy monk was once asked what the surest and shortest way to heaven was. And his reply was this, be humble and take leave of yourself wherever you are. How well he expressed in a few simple words all that can be said on this matter. For it is in humility and in walking away from one's pleasures, both of body and of mind, that a great part of our ever attaining perfection is based. Because if self-love were to be eradicated from our hearts, there would be nothing left there but love of God. Let me elucidate this point further. We are made in God's image, so God is the very center of our souls. He is there in our innermost there in the deepest part of our hearts. But between the depths of our being and the external us, the us as we see ourselves, we have all this stuffing made up of the world and of things of the world, a stuffing that packs the soul and obstructs our being able to touch him, a deafening padding that prevent us from hearing and sensing him. And as a result, the more of the world we have in us, the less we can feel our center, and the more distant we are, therefore, from God. If we were to rid ourselves of this buffer, we would reach our depths and get to him easily and be with him. That is what fleeing from oneself means, simply put, to ignore any desires and seductions that are contrary to God. He who truly denies himself and flees from his self at any time, place or circumstance has in his heart the words of Christ, not my will, Father, but yours. These words made all he suffered and was about to suffer meritorious. Firstly, because he surrendered his will to the will in the approbation of his Father and for his glory. Secondly, because he, he bound his will to perpetual obedience until death. And thirdly, because one could almost say he tied his Father's hands. And he did this in such a way that the father could no longer deliver him from drinking the most bitter cup of his passion. Through Christ's prayer, 
his act of resignation, and through the abnegation and surrender of his will, the father was, so to speak, either forced to deliver him to that passion which his will had already assigned and determined, or to disturb the obedience and resignation of the son, through which, above all, he wished his father's will to be fulfilled. As a result, the words having been said, it was not possible for Christ to be spared the cup of his passion, precisely because of these two wills. The will of the Father, efficaciously offered, and the will of the Son, efficaciously accepted. I hope it is clear how significant self-denial and submission of one's will are to God. There is no sacrifice more agreeable to him or more valuable to the soul than this, because there is nothing man, man prizes so highly as his freedom to will and to act. And when you give up this freedom, you give all you can give. But self-denial, submission and surrender are still not enough for a perfect life. The Divine Master added something else, to pick up our cross and follow him. The life of the Christian is a life crucified and one cannot take a step forward following Christ without carrying a cross. This is from the Apostle to Corinthians 4. We suffer persecution but are not forsaken. We are cast down but we perish not. Always bearing... I'm sorry, that the, it's so small, the print. Always uh, bearing about in our body the mortification of Jesus that the life also of Jesus be, may be made first in our bodies. For we who live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our mortal flesh. <coughs> These are the, the words of the Apostle and worthy of careful consideration. Weigh them if you want to mortify yourself in the image of Jesus, for there you will see and comprehend how essential it is to eradicate self-love from the soul. You will not find a trace of it in Jesus. All you will find is constant submission and surrender to the wishes of the Father until his death. I shall now end on this note. Self-love, as I have said, is the foundation and root of all evil, and in short, you will not free yourself from it unless you are ready to destroy it and crucify it in your heart. You must do this because this self-serving master, once implanted in your soul, is far from sterile. From it, two other different loves are born, one pertaining to the mind, representing our worship of status and success and concern for reputation and view of one's own standing and excellence, and the other pertaining to the senses, our unquenchable thirst for physical satisfaction of all kinds. Therefore, if, in contempt of God, you put yourself above him, you are going to love yourself in either of these two ways, by means of the mind or by means of the flesh, for it is from these two false gods that all others are begotten. If you worship your excellence and reputation, and what others think or say about you. You're going to love everything that leads to flattery, aggr aggrandizement, adulation. And if it is sensual delights you are after, 
you will unceasingly search for anything that promotes them or contributes to them, forever caught in a world of increasing them and discarding them and increasing them again. But what is common to both pleasures of body and mind, however, is that we do not love them for themselves. We do not love temporal and external things for what they are, but for the satisfaction we get from them. Thus, the more satisfaction they give us, the closer and the more entrenched they become established in our heart. And because the king of all these false gods, to whom they all bow and pay heed and obedience, is worldly success, usually represented by the shortcut of money, money tends to be loved above all else. And so, you see, we love degrees and titles and appellations and ranks, and we love careers and status and commissions and positions. And we love dioceses and bishoprics and, uh, and missions and jurisdictions. All these we love, but what we are really loving is ourselves. We use them for our satisfaction and aggrandizement. We use them to worship ourselves. So, my dear brothers and sisters in the Catholic faith, I have been saying this all along and I'm going to say it one more time. All sins are either founded on this self-centered and self-serving love or are born from it. Self-love begets arrogance. Arrogance being love of the adoring view we have of ourselves. It begets lust and gluttony, which is an excessive devotion to carnal joy. It begets avarice, the disorderly yearning for external things, mainly money. And since what we love about, above all else is our own standing, reputation, and the recognition afforded us by others, we are now going to hate everything else that stands in their way. And so now we have rage and anger which are born out of love, of vengeance of those who would frustrate our ambitions, passions and delights. And we have envy which is hate of someone else's fortune and love of his misfortune when it affects us in any way. But it does not stop here. This monster is not content with affecting the mind only. It is eager to spread its tentacles to the body too, and now we have laziness, lack of discipline, idleness, which the body especially loves. All of this will prevent us from starting or continuing good and virtuous works. St. Bernard was right when he said, if only we could pluck out this poisonous weed from our hearts, there would be no need for help. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.